parents to be involved, as you all know, because you're already involved in the Massachusetts Menstrual Equity Coalition. Um, thank you for being a part of this volunteer-led movement. We are all grassroots activists, individuals, some affiliated with organizations, but also you don't have to be in order to be a part of our organization and our coalition. Um, we officially founded the Massachusetts Menstrual Equity Coalition in 2019 in order to convene our menstrual equity activists around the state so that we get to know each other. And our number one bill, our priority as a coalition is to pass the I AM bill. The I AM bill is an acronym for increased access to menstrual products. And just last week, we worked with our lead sponsors, Senator Jalen, I saw you on Zoom, Rep Barber and Rep Livingstone to introduce this legislation that would make period products free in all schools, K through 12 all shelters and all incarcerated facilities in Massachusetts. If passed, this would be the most comprehensive menstrual equity legislation in the country. And we believe that we have the people power here to make this bill a reality, but we need your help. So our goal for today is for you to meet each other because you can't do this work alone. And it's important to have relationships in order to be a strong movement. So I hope that you already have met someone today. And if you haven't, reach out, ask their name. Um, and we hope that you, by the end of today, feel empowered to speak about why period poverty is a real issue. Break the silence around period poverty, because we know that it's not a new issue. It's just new to talk about it. And we hope you talk to your legislators your state rep and your state senator and say, this is the session we need to pass this bill. We passed it in the Senate unanimously last session. So that means every single one of your senators already is in support, but it was not brought up for a vote in the House. So this year we're hoping to have an early hearing in March, April, May. So get ready for that. And then we're, um, going to have to keep reminding our legislators every time it moves through the process that until the governor signs it, we need to keep the heat on and bringing up periods and making sure that people know there's a sense of urgency. Even if they don't see us bleeding, we are bleeding every month. <laughs> um, and periods don't stop for pandemics. The last thing I want to say before I hand it over to our keynote speaker, who I'm excited to introduce, is I wanted to thank um, the volunteers who made today possible. I wanna thank Ali and the Northeastern students who helped reserve this space and set up the space. Ali will also be our moderator for the summit today. Um, I wanna raise your hand if you're in the Massachusetts Menstrual Equity Coalition. Awesome, so you can look around, see each other. You've seen each other on Zooms. Maybe you're raising your hand on Zoom too. Um, and I want to thank our sponsors. We had three sponsors who made today possible. Pads on a Roll, who you've seen downstairs. Genius. Um, we have Fury, also a very exciting uh, menstrual product distribution company that is working around the state to meet the unique needs of menstruators because you all know one size does not fit all cycles. And we have the Metro West um, Commission on the Status of Women who have made today possible and help pay for our, our speakers and our food. So thank you to our sponsors. Awesome. So we are going to hear from Dr. Bobel. We're going to have a performance by Naomi Westwater, which I'm really excited about. And we're going to then move straight into our panel of menstrual activists working on the ground. It's two and a half hours in this room. Then we'll be going back downstairs for pizza and for more mingling. And then I know you know that there are workshops happening. In case you were curious, we have two workshops will be happening after lunch. One with goddess Cecilia, you might have already met. Vula the... the uh, Oh, I can't. I love Thank you. I was going to say it. Rule of the vulva and make your own 
vulva crafts. Um, and then we also have Bria Gadsen from Love Your Menses, who's going to be leading a workshop on managing period pain. How is it that we have been to the moon? We have all this science exploration and they still just say Advil? That's the best we can do. We can do better. Okay, don't get me started. Now let me introduce <laughs> Dr. Bobel, the mother of critical menstrual studies, as I and many other fans like to call her. Um, Dr. Bobel is a professor of women, gender, and sexuality studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and has been researching, writing, and speaking on critical menstruation studies for over two decades. Her most recent books include The Managed Body, Developing Girls and Menstrual Health in the Global South, and the co-edited collections of Body Battlegrounds, Transgressions, Tensions, and Transformations, and Open Source, The Palgrave Handbook of Critical Menstruation Studies, which you can see copies of downstairs in the common area. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Boba. So I guess if I'm going to be the mother, I'm going to also do some chores. Um, and thanks to Sasha and to Allie and to Megara and to the commission and to the volunteers. Um, super cool to see you all here. When I started doing this work, okay, is that going to work? When I started doing this work 20 years ago, I could hardly get three people in a room to talk about this. Um, so to see so many people here, you're going to watch me fail at this task here. Um, to see so many people here is super thrilling. Um, and I want to take a picture, can I? Yeah. Okay. All right, but I want you to look bloody awesome. So, great if you're smart and you're sass. Are you ready? Make it sassy. One more. No, I gotta get this side. Sassy on this side. And Magar, can you do something? I want the zoomies too. Let me just set my timer. I'm hoping to leave plenty of time for Q&A because I want to actually not talk at you, but talk with you. And let me get this started. All right, so I have prepared some remarks, as they say. But again, my focus is on a conversation. So the point of this talk is just to get us chatting with one another. Cool. And here is the very wordy title of my talk. <clears throat> so I'll begin. In 1973, 13 women gathered in a friend's home to stage the first ever lead-in. The organizers, Janice Delaney, Mary Toth, Mary Jane Lupton, and Emily Toth decided they required a quote, ritual of female culture to stimulate their joint writing of a history of the culture of menstruation, the first ever. They published it three years later with the title, The Curse. The women in attendance shared stories of their first periods, critiqued educational films made by product makers, and scrawled menstrual graffiti on the bathroom wall. Nearly three decades later, a punk and an anarchist group called the Blood Sisters, based in Montreal, marched defiantly at the now defunct Michigan Women's Music Festival insisting we ax tampax. In other words, don't support body shaming menstrual product makers and go DIY, do it yourself. Better for the planet, better for the body. And as a throwback to second wave feminism, they reprise the classic feminist slogan, the personal is political. Now, more than 20 years later, we gather together in this room and on Zoom, to reflect on a movement that has emerged from these humble and fringy beginnings to a place of stature from margin to mainstream. But over time, menstrual activism has increasingly stood on its own, pulling away from its scrappy, fierce origins 
and shifting to what I call a more accommodationist approach. <laughs> the vast majority of menstrual activism happening today in the US and across the globe is focused on menstrual product access, which has, I assert, ultimately and ironically, reinscribed the value of the so-called hygienic, that is, respectable body. And more importantly, it largely fails to examine the very roots of menstrual stigma. More specifically, the movement has turned its back on its radical, radical history to reinvent itself as a neoliberal enterprise, one that repeatedly turns to the market to solve the problem of menstrual stigma. And I think this is a mistake. Why? Because framing menstrual activism when we frame menstrual activism, we must resist the social construction of the menstruating body as abject, as a body in crisis, as a body in need of rescue. So real talk, I'm choosing to be very direct with you this morning because I care deeply about menstrual activism. I want this movement to flourish. I want it to be made real through its enduring, systemic impacts. And I don't think we can get there if we don't stop and think very, very carefully about the assumptions that slip into our work, assumptions, assumptions we must hold up to the light. Menstrual activism, after all, is part of the complex and enduring project of loosening the social control of the body, especially the marginalized body. It moves embodiment more generally from object to subject status. What's more, while menstrual activism is about bleeding, unapologetically so, it is also not only about bleeding. The work of reframing menstruation is foundational to taking on a, a host of other urgent issues such as human trafficking, eating disorders, sexual assault, and so many more. This means that menstrual activism can and frankly must link up to broader movements in robust and meaningful ways, particularly the radical feminist movement that seeks to look at the deeper root structures of inequalities that are based in patriarchy, racism, classism, cis heteronormativity, and more. I call on us all to draw on the broader movement for body autonomy and connect menstrual activism to reproductive justice movements and a host of others, such as labor. I'm going to start sharing the screen. Oh, possibly. yes, of course. Can you get around my <laughs> housekeeping setup? I can. Why don't I just have this? Sorry. Oh, so they haven't seen all those slides. Oh, let's fix that. Um, the present button. Yeah, goddess. <laughs> Good. Where was I? Environmental justice. <laughs> Me too. And of course, Black Lives Matter. When we regard the menstrual cycle as a normal biological process and indeed a vital sign, we reject the idea that menstruation is merely a nuisance, a foil to femininity or business opportunity. This does not mean that period hate is necessarily replaced with period love. For some, including those who experience painful periods and those who are menstruators but do not identify, do not identify as women or girls, menstruation can be traumatic, troublesome, even dangerous. A progressive and radical menstrual activism does not replace one dogma with another. Rather, it looks to the root causes of menstrual stigma in order to detach the menstrual cycle from commodification and medicalization. You with me? So in my talk today, I'm gonna to draw an analysis I did with my colleague, Bri Brian Foss, in which we argue that a bloodless politics of menstruation, that's what we call it, is dominating today's menstrual activism. We think it's dangerously accommodationist, there's that big word again, because it strives for social acceptability and settles for incremental change. So let me pose an intentionally 
provocative, provocative question. And let me ask also, in our movement work, are we too concerned with respectability politics? Might we inadvertently, and no doubt with good mean, with good intent, be pursuing a Band-Aid approach to solving the big problem of menstrual stigma? So I wanna be clear, today's menstrual activism has met some stellar success, including right here in this state, including right here at, the, at your hands, for instance, activists all over the country have agitated to pass state level laws to make menstrual products accessible to inmates on demand. This is terrific, but we have to tread carefully before we pop the champagne corks because products are not the end goal. What these initiatives miss are the fundamental critiques of the very prison industrial complex, such as interrogating differential treatment of prisoners, depending on their access to commissary monies, and a robust analysis of the power dynamics between guards and prisoners. These approaches fail to explain why menstrual stigma is leveraged to exert control over incarcerated bodies in the first place. So imagine the outcomes if other movements adopted this accommodationist stance, and I'm intentionally being provocative and sarcastic here. Imagine if the health at every size movement, instead of focusing on fat phobia, began promoting Weight Watchers. Imagine if the Black Lives Matter movement, rather than focusing on police reform and even abolition, held workshops to train people of color to politely interact with the police. Because the language of menstruation is bounded by the vocabulary of sexism and Western supremacy and the capitalist grammar of capitalism, people are socialized, all of us, to think about menstruation through products like tampons, pads, cuffs, panties, even birth control. Instead, I want to invite us all to speak a different language, one that values menstruating in public. And I do mean that literally, if that works for you, but more importantly, figuratively by shining a public light on this widely shared but rarely discussed experience. I want us to bring forth a bloody, messy, embodied version of menstruation so that the roots of menstrual stigma can be made visible. Brianne and I call this radical menstrual embodiment. So in my remaining time, how am I doing? Okay, thanks, Sasha. I want to spend a few minutes talking about two very dominant frames that are used to conceptualize movement priorities, particularly in the US. They are public health and gender equity. The vision guiding both of these frames remain oh so subtly, almost imperceptibly, mired in the menstrual mandate of shame, silence, and secrecy, because they do not fundamentally question the norms of embodiment rooted in the denigration of the gendered body. First frame, public health. As you may know, public health is a field invested in promoting healthy behaviors that prevent illness and disease. Thus, this particular framework for menstrual activism rationalizes certain foci, such as improving access to products for the poor, who it is assumed, although not supported in the literature, that they will develop illness if they do not use so-called hygienic means to manage their flow. Of course, let me be clear, poor and homeless menstruators should be afforded unrestricted access to the materials they need to care for their periods. That's not debatable. But the public health frame also must engage with why agencies, schools, public facilities, et cetera, until recently, did not typically provide menstrual materials to the people they serve, right? What are the underlying resistances? What are the underlying assumptions? Assumption, assumptions, is, I just made up a word, assumptions. <laughs> Oops. Furthermore, uh, <clears throat> furthermore, in the public health framework, the menstrual cycle as a meaningful marker of health and well-being, indeed what some call the fifth vital sign, receives scant attention. Most menstrual discourse and thus action decontextualizes menstruation, excising it from the continuous four-phased menstrual cycle that impacts multiple body systems over decades of the life course. 
So such a view is a limited opportunity. Second frame, gender equity. This one's gonna hit home because I think this is the one that captures the work most of us are doing. The gender equity frame often referred to as the menstrual equity or period poverty model of menstrual activism takes a liberal feminist assessment or a within system assessment of gender inequitable distribution of resources. The value of this approach, of course, is that it contests male bodies as standard. That's terrific. A key fixation in this frame is the eradication of the so-called tampon tax and related efforts to make menstrual products widely accessible, such as the IM bill. These agendas obviously center on menstrual products, but let's think about menstrual products for a moment. Feminist historian Shara Vostrel, sorry, that is a botched slide, um, so bear with me, calls them technologies of passing, technologies of passing tools we use to hide the fact of our bleeding bodies. Is the problem that we don't have something to bleed on, or is the bigger problem that we breach the social code of menstrual invisibility? When we do that, we are shamed. In this frame, we assume supplying more material to more menstruators will liberate us. And in the short term, that's right. But, I urge us to strategize for the long-term, to make long-term change that troubles the conceptualization of menstruation as a problem to be solved, right? So that the target is not, is not product in hands of people, but troubling menstrual stigma, which underlies, right? That lack of access in the first place. So I call this, this product-focused approach um, prioritizing the managed body and I titled the book by that, no coincidence. Um, and because I think it seeds the menstrual movement to the product makers. So I get it. Anti-tampon tax efforts and campaigns at local, state, and national levels to make products free target an achievable goal. It's measurable, it's scalable, right? That's important. And funders love that. But the impact, I argue, is arguably and mostly symbolic because it actually makes a relatively negligible financial impact on menstruators. What's more, these campaigns subtly, underline subtly, perpetuate a stigmatized assumption of menstruation as nuisance, which is hardly a body positive or even body neutral way of conceptualizing the very thing we aim to destigmatize. So note the language in these graphics which definitely locate menstruation as not a luxury, right? As a burden, as something we must endure, right? I think these kinds of framings are problematic. A related set of efforts that fall under this frame are focused on the design of better and more user-friendly menstrual products. Think innovations in femtech. Think fix. Anybody follow this story? Right. So. When we use this frame, we, um, we articulate the need for better, for more sophisticated, for more cutting edge, for more convenient, for more lifestyle friendly. You may have noticed that menopause has become the new it girl of the um, femtech scene. The New York Times did a piece last month where they described the, gold, the menopause gold rush because it's become such a target for entrepreneurs and startups. So when we regard menstruation as a problem to be solved through consumer culture, we often fail to bring our healthy curiosity to these new innovations, asking, for instance, asking thinks, what do you mean by non-toxic? Show me the receipts. So while the gender equity frame is ostensibly intersectional through its emphasis on poor and otherwise marginalized menstruators, it is an impoverished reckoning with the complexity of menstruator lives. The product-focused neoliberal framing is dangerous because it situates menstrual activism as very, very small in focus, a move that makes it difficult to link menstrual activism to other movements like the ones I showed you earlier. What we need is a broader critique, one that's paired with our product-based activism. We don't need to throw that out, but I think we need to complicate it. 
We need to be critical of the prison industrial complex, of class warfare, of police brutality, of institutionalized racism, of that phobia, of the medical industrial complex, of transphobia, and above all, body shaming and body policing. We must refuse to inadvertently trivialize menstrual activism, shrinking it down to just managing bleeding and then thereby lessen its political impact. So in summary, The realization of radical menstrual embodiment insists on taking seriously what it means to be radical. You gotta push beyond the colloquial meaning of radical as extreme or outrageous, although I like both of those things a lot. <laughs> but we need to think about it as it is as it's denotatively right met, which is to the root. The politics of radical embodiment is one that aims to remove the source of body negativity that grows in the soil of white supremacist, heteronormative misogyny. Yes, I'm showing you this slide again because I want to burn it into your brains. This means that menstrual activism, your menstrual activism, that you're here to learn more about and connect with others over and make real must refuse shame-based framings. We have to think bigger. We have to attend to not only the shedding of the uterine lining, but more broadly, the entire menstrual cycle across the life course from monarchy past menopause. This expanded view makes room for a broader range of experiences relative to the many phases of the menstrual cycle, including, including those of marginalized menstruators, as well as associated disorders like polycystic ovary syndrome, endometriosis, and so on. Our resistance requires challenging assumptions about the body. It demands that we rip out the diseased root of menstrual stigma. There it is, three's the charm. As menstrual activists, we must re-examine our strategic priorities and ensure that we are working to fundamentally challenge rather than reinforce stigma. So I leave you with a few messages. First, expand the frames, address the menstrual cycle, not just menstruation, promote menstrual literacy, learning about the body, not just menstrual hygiene, right? Not just cleanliness, not just managing the flow. And engage communities, not just girls. We have to think about everyone around the menstruator, including the menstruator that doesn't identify as a girl or a woman. More effective menstrual concealment does not fight stigma, it accommodates it. The future of the menstrual movement cannot be ceded to the product makers. In other words, don't use stigma to fight stigma. Menstrual literacy is the best remedy for body shame and quick fixes. We need body positive language that promotes embodied agency, not bottom lines. And finally, let's push back on this persistent message. And we can rewrite it using our new language, our new radical language to read. Your body is a site of power, pleasure, and potential. You're, you deserve to feel good in your body. Your body is fine just the way it is. Thanks. How much time do we have for chit chat? Oh, five minutes when I went over. I apologize. Uh, all right, but I'll, I'm going to stick around. So if you want to grab me and, and come and you know chat outside of this forum, do so. Cool. So comments, questions, push back. I love a good challenge. Bring it. Yeah. Thank you so much for the incredible introductions. Uh, so what is your opinion on menstruation legislation and how that should be framed to really resonate what you just said? Yeah, I really appreciate that question. So I want to be clear. I'm not against the legislation. <laughs> I'm not against product access. But I think that we have to be careful when we 
write those pieces of legislation and we speak about menstruation, then we use body positive language and we don't say things like, as you know, menstruation is not a luxury. I think that is a, it really is counterproductive. Um, and I think we have to, if, while we have the attention of our legislators, we have to push for menstrual literacy training, right? So we can't say, you know, products are not a silver bullet. So if we've got their attention, if we've got their attention enough to convince them that this is an issue, this is an appropriate issue for legislative intervention, then let's also talk about menstrual health education, right? At the school level, at the community level. So there have to be resources for that too, because if you just throw products at the problem, you will not undo menstrual stigma. So I think it's about language, and I think it's about also addressing the need for menstrual health education, which is dire in this country. Do you know who the main purveyors of menstrual health education are in American schools? Do you know who's providing the materials? Gym teachers. <laughs> yes, those are the messengers, but who provides the materials? Product companies. Procter and Gamble, um, Kimberly Johnson, uh, Kim Johnson and Johnson. Um, they provide the lion's share of menstrual health education materials. And so they are able to use this as a platform to begin right, marketing the materials to, to youth, right? And what, what the makers know based on their market research is that if they are able to get, um, uh, cultivate a consumer at the beginning of their menstrual cycle, they'll stick with that product their whole life long. If they can, right? So they build a loyalty to the product. To the product. The product. So it's a really important moment. Appreciate your question. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm curious um, about a specific, like kind of following up on the policy question. I'm wondering um, about some of the laws that we've seen passing in like the EU that are giving sick leave to people who are menstruating. Yeah. I can see on one hand how that enforces the sort of like sickness, but yes. at the same time, a lot of people have yeah. a lot of pain. I'm just curious yeah. how this uh, what your thoughts are on that? Yeah, I appreciate the question. So menstrual leave, right, is something that's getting a lot of attention. And there's such a fierce and wonderful, complex feminist debate about it, right? Does it reinscribe stigma and sort of socially construct the menstruating body as ill, as in need of special consideration? Or does it actually meet us where we're at? Like, and how, what's the push and pull there? And, you know, I'm a, mostly a feminist theorist, so I'm not very helpful with the practical stuff. I'll admit that. <laughs> But what I want to say is that those policies can only work in workplaces that are already body inclusive, right? That already recognize people with diabetes, and people with various mobility impairments, right? People that are on the spectrum and people that are sight impaired. So if, if this culture is already one that is very rigid and upholds a certain kind of body as normative, then that kind of policy will backfire. Because it, what it does is it or, you're already disadvantaged in this space. You're not allowed to bring your body to a place. Right? We have this very bizarre Cartesian model, right? Where you go to work and you leave your body behind. You also leave your family behind. You leave your, you leave your emotions behind, right? We have to trouble that kind of context. And so I think really in some ways menstrual leave is ahead of its time because we have so much work to do at the site of the workplace to make bodies, let bodies be bodies. So I'm ambivalent, frankly. Mm -hmm. And I think where it's work, the sites, the work sites are already progressive. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a messy one. Yeah, I love messy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. huh. What are, I guess, how do you, um, I love all the conversation around like, now it comes back to consumerism yeah. and capitalism. And it feels like a lot of our issues in society come back to that. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, we don't want to center it around products and consumerism yeah. and capitalism. Right. Um, and it always kind of reminds me of this quote of like, we're not going to bring down the master's house with the master's tool. Of the Lord. But also, what, what I see in uh, society is like political change happens when big businesses are hurt, when their bottom line is hurt. So how do we, right. um, you know, what, how do we combat you know, but we hurt big business by staging product drops. We don't. We don't. We fortify them, right? We we line their pockets, right? So that's the first piece. So where are where are the gals from? The cool. I, I have your button. Where are you? <laughs> um, that do the product drive. They're still store. downstairs. Yeah. Oh, they're downstairs. So they are doing something interesting. They're curating menstrual products from startups and women-led business. Those their words. My business, 
and basically supplying these eager activists with the materials they need to do the product distribution, but they're not doing the product drive. They're doing it for you. So they're already vetting the, organist, the, the producers of products for safety, for you know, carbon footprint, for business practices, et cetera. I, I hope I'm not overselling them. I don't know about the business practices part, but um, <laughs> they should be. So let's talk some of that. Um, and so that what the products you're distributing are not supporting Procter & Gamble. You know, Procter & Gamble literally killed women in the 80s mm -hmm. with tampons. You gotta remember that. And these major multinational corporations, and I'm thinking of Procter & Gamble primarily and, and Kimberly Clark and, and Johnson & Johnson, have been historically using shame to sell you your products. They are constructing the menstruating body as in need of rescue, right? That a leak will ruin your life. So of course they're cultivating this posture of gratitude. Thank you so much for saving me from my bloody, bloody body, right? So we want to be really careful that we don't support them, right? And I don't know about like every major change has involved major corporations. Hmm. I don't know about that. Is that true? I don't think it's always been true. I just, it's the sense that I get, you know, um, with uh, Black Lives Matter, with the Me Too movement and uh, canceling certain businesses. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes profitable for these businesses to be like, oh, of course Black Lives Matter. But because right. it's, a, it's a brand play for them. Absolutely. So it's part of their community or their, their corporate social responsibility. They're going to, I mean, you've seen them all, all the banks are crying. Right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. I want to see. I want. I want to see what they're actually doing to support their people. I don't want them just to hand me tote bags at Pride in June. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you can get a tote bag. Show me what you do for pure folks. Right. So I want to be. I want to trouble that assumption that we need the corporate buy-in. I think we have to hold corporations accountable. I don't think we need their permission, and I don't think we should adopt the tactic. Anything else before I know I got to get out of here? Anything else? <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, hi, Lisa. Um, so I come. So I was a gender women study thing for an undergrad. So very much feminist theory, and then now I'm also a public policy student. And something that I struggle with, that I guess I appreciate your insight on, is how do you translate the feminist theory and everything that you're saying into the policy space when, like we're still trying to, you know, teach legislators or whoever yeah. how to even say the word intersectional or the thing. Right. It's <laughs> it's, you know, right. very far, it's like 20 steps behind. Absolutely. Well, right. So you probably don't use that word, right? So, you know, you talk about the diversity of menstruators. You talk about how we can't assume that all menstruator needs are equally or equal, that people have equal access to materials, right? I mean, so you 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 live it, you don't use the labels because the labels will put them off, right? So you're asking about how to talk intersectionality, but I think you had another question. I guess it just yeah, more generally just kind of translating the yeah. feminist theory into the language of policymakers, because like you said, it's very much about measurable impact, yeah. bottom line, being able to do an evaluation and see yeah. exactly how many people it's yeah. impacted or how much money right. is being saved when what you're talking about is so much broader than that. So right. how do you right. You know, right. Well I think I mean that's a long conversation, I think, but the headline is is that when you're talking about product access, you have to connect it to other products that we access and don't think twice about, like toilet paper and hand towels and soap, that kind of thing. There's that. But again, I think we have to push harder on mental health education. And we can connect that to other kinds of education that we get, right? That we do not question providing students, right? And we can, by the way, let's stop with the fifth grade gym teacher bullshit, right? <laughs> Why not integrate mental health into social studies and economics and in bio class and in chemistry? Put a tampon in, a, in, a, in some water and see what happens, right? There are lots in, in literature, right? There are lots of sites where we can talk about the, menst the menstrual experience that are not a gym teacher with some very anxious teacher who was handed a doctor last week and told to do it. Because if your menstrual subjectivity is uncomfortable, you're going to communicate that to everyone else, right? So I think we have to really talk about the importance of education. And, you know, all legislators want to be pro-education, right? So get them where they're at. Education matters. And this is how we, we try open the space to make products accessible, to make products safer, to pay, protect the environment and care for our bodies. It has to start with that literacy training. 
All right, I'm going to say goodbye and hope that we can chat later. Thank you. for sharing your insight, your experience, and really grounding and centering us in our discussion today. Can we give one more round of applause? Thank you. So we're going to take a five minute break until 11 or however many minutes that is left until 11 um, to set up for our next performance. So feel free to grab some more coffee, snacks, use the restroom, um, and we'll be back at 11. Thank